good news. God answers prayer. Amen. And one of the prayers that we all prayed last week was for uh, Brandon's baby, Benny. And that baby had a successful procedure, and they're now home. If you guys are watching, just uh, know that we love you very much, and we're going to continue to pray. Uh, and so whenever you guys have concerns, make sure you uh, share them with us. Uh, send, a me- uh, send us a message on Facebook or email us or something. We have a whole bunch of praying people here that love to lift your requests up to the Lord. Well, 10 or 11 years ago, see, Kelsey and I moved into this house that was, you know, kind of out in the woods and needed a whole bunch of trees cut down and brush, you know, kind of uh, piled up and burned and stuff like that. So I had been doing that on my days off. And one morning, Kelsey and I decided to take a walk and our little daughter, Abigail, was with us. She was just three or four years old. And, you know, little kids, who, who, has, who has ever had a little one? Who has a child who's ever wanted to go their own way and do their own thing? Oh, it's universal, huh? Funny. So Abigail, who is a strong little girl, she decided she wanted to go. We were going around the brush pile this way. She wanted to go around this great big brush pile. It was bigger than a car uh, and go that way. We were like, okay, it's 10, 20 feet. We're going to come back around. Well, we get to the other side of this brush pile, and I hear my little bitty precious daughter say, Mmm, I love eating mushrooms. <laughs> Ran to her. I'm choking because I'm thinking, like, what's going on? And, and I said, spit them out, spit them out. She's, of course, like, scared and trying to swallow them real fast, right? Well, we got a hold of, you know, looking up what particular mushroom she was eating because I'm not a biologist, by the way. And so, so it turns out there's lots of mushrooms, and the particular one that she ate, we narrowed it down to these two specific mushrooms. One of them, she'd be totally fine, and the other one, she'd be dead in an hour. That was a little stressful. Our next door neighbor is a super, you know, outdoorsman, has studied all of these, you know, things. He came over and he sat down at our kitchen table with us and with Abigail. And he had a little jar of a solution of activated charcoal and a Cadbury egg. Activated charcoal is just charcoal that's it's super, super finely ground up, and it was in a solution of water. It's like Pepto-Bismol on steroids. It's actually an effective antitoxin. And that little girl looked at that shiny wrapping on that Cadbury egg, and he said, Abigail. My neighbor, by the way, was trained in not hostage negotiation. It's a good thing, because all little children are terrorists. <laughs> He said, Abby, would you like this Cadbury egg? All you have to do is drink this murky black liquid. (laughs) She looked at that egg. She looked at that solution. And she, bam, slammed that and grabbed that egg. And she was happy as a clam. Now, maybe she would have been fine. But that was a stressful moment for me and Kelsey. Because we knew that our daughter may have ingested something that was toxic. And there was a solution right in front of her. And if you've ever gotten so frustrated, you've tried to make a kid eat or drink something. How'd that go for you? Yeah, not so good. You know, in the same way, you can see where I'm going with this. You and I wish all of our stories about toxic stuff ended that well, right? You and I wish that all of our loved ones who have ingested the toxins that they run into in this life had a solution that they looked at and they chose that solution to get better. But you and I both know that that's not the case. As we walk through this life, God gives us choices. We have free will to choose the path that we're going to take. And sometimes we choose a path knowing that we're walking away from God, and that leads us to some toxic places. And I'm here to tell you, I think, I hope you know this, but new life exists to reach out from people uh, to people who are far from God. This, This is what gets me out of bed in the morning. 
And what we see in Scripture is that God is on this mission to reach out to people who are wandering from him and experiencing all the most toxic stuff that this life has to offer. In the very beginning of Scripture, we see the consequences of not following God. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see how God created the earth and he formed Adam and Eve in his image and he gave them meaningful work and everything they needed in the Garden of Eden. There was a tree in the, that God had planted in the center of that garden called the Tree of Life. And Adam and Eve got to eat from that tree that God had planted and live. There was life in that tree. God supplied for them. And one of the most amazing things that God supplied for Adam and Eve was the ability for them to communicate with him face to face. Imagine that. Just getting to speak with the living God face to face as he walked through the garden. God had warned Adam and Eve that if they disobeyed him and ate from the one tree he instructed them not to, because they had to have free moral choice, that they would die. But in just the third chapter of Scripture, we see that they believed a whole set of lies. And those lies that Adam and Eve bit on are the same lies that you and I are tempted to believe. God doesn't have your best in mind. God's holding out on you. Everything that God has provided and created that is good isn't good enough that the best is outside of God's will. God knows that, that if you go and chase after that, you'll, come, you'll become more like him. Same lies. So, they're tempted they choose to sin. Because of their sin, they have to leave paradise. They're no longer able to meet with God face to face. And predictably, bad things happen. Just one chapter later, in Genesis 4, one brother, Cain, kills his brother Abel. The parents who were born with no sin in themselves but then chose to sin, experienced one of their sons murdering the other. Make no mistake, what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. Adam and Eve made a choice to sin, knowing that, if God, that God had told them, if you do this, you'll surely die. And they tasted the heartache of death before they even died. In Genesis 5, we're introduced to Noah and his family. In chapter 6, we read about how bad things had gotten so quickly. In Genesis 6, 5 through 6, we read, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. That's pretty bad. So God flooded the earth, but saved Noah and his family because Noah found favor in God's eyes. He lived in God's ways, and that was pleasing to the Lord. Through Noah, God saved humanity, but even Noah was deeply flawed. The opening pages in Scripture in Genesis display how God created everything. He breathed life into the people that he made in his own image, how he warned them of the consequences of not following him. And then, after they disobeyed him, how things became chaotic when they chose not to follow the living God. The good news is that the entire time people have been walking away from God, he was working a plan for our good and for his glory that would reverse the curse of disobedience and bring us back into relationship with him. I want you to know, before we go any further today, that if you have been walking away from God who loves you, even if you've left him, he has not given up on you. The fact that you're hearing this message today is proof that he still loves you and still wants to have a relationship with you. 
And if someone that you love has walked away from the Lord, do not give up hope. You may be worn out by years of praying for them, but God is not worn out. He's got all the hope you need. He is working a plan for their good and for his glory, even if you cannot see it yet. Keep praying and keep looking for God opportunities. Today, I want to show you how God uses people who will follow him to save those who are not. What we can be assured of is that the will of God is that every person comes to a saving knowledge of his grace in Christ. How do we know that? Lots of scriptures, including 2 Peter chapter 3, which says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God has been patiently working a plan throughout history to bring people into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. The next verse says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it be laid bare. Friends, our time here is brief. I know with the way that the last 18 months have rolled by, it seems like our time here can be all-consuming. The way that your week comes at you and then is over before you feel like it got started seems like this treadmill that we're on in life is never going to end. But guess what? The day of the Lord is going to come soon. Maximum, it's a number of decades for us. And it could be tomorrow. What we know is that eternity is a long time. Understatement of the year, right? And so this gives us a sense of urgency. Because we want to share the news that God is love. And it's his will that all people hear and believe the good news about Jesus. But because God gave us free will, not all will be saved. Some people will choose to reject God, and God will respect their decisions. God allows us to choose to walk our own way and to end up in hell forever separated from him. He doesn't want that for anyone, not for your worst enemy. And if you know the good news of the gospel, you have Christ making you new, then this is God's plan for you. Again, God uses people who will follow him to save those who are not. It's true in your life, God's put people who knew Jesus in your life to help you know Jesus. How many of you can point to a person who God has used to point you to Jesus? Yeah, again and again. Many of you know the person who prayed for you ceaselessly so that you would come to know Jesus Christ. God uses people who will follow him to save those who are not. And God wants to use you to change eternity for others. It begins with you committing to follow him wherever he leads you. So let's look at Genesis chapter 12 as we see one of the most important promises that God ever made. Again, in the first book of scripture, we see God working this plan. And we see here that God's call to follow him is attached to a promise that includes blessings for generations. This is a powerful promise God made to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, before God changed his name, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I want you to notice something right there. God's call to follow him begins with a go from. I don't 
think I have to work really hard to convince us that the world we live in is just soaked in sin and selfishness. And so it's just natural that when we hear the call of the almighty, all-powerful, all-holy God of the universe calling us into relationship with him, that's always a call to go from where we're beginning. God calls people, us, from the common to what's set apart, from the everyday to the holy. Did you know that the opposite of holy, we often think that the opposite of holy is wicked. You know what the opposite of holy really is? Common. The jokes that all of your friends at work laugh at, but you know are not cool. The websites everybody goes to, but you know this does not meet spec with the holiness God's calling you to. The conversations your family is always thrown around and you're like, it's just not okay. God calls his people to step out of the common and the everyday and to step into something that's altogether different. And our response to God matters, not just to us, but to all the people who our lives will touch. God is absolutely concerned about you, but he's also concerned about the people your life will impact. Look at the promise that God made to Abram. He said, I will make you into a great nation. He was looking for one man who would be willing to go from where he was and to go to where God told him. He said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Look at those two things. I will bless you. I will make you a blessing. Has God blessed you? He's done that to bless you because he loves you, but he's also done that so that you can be a blessing to others. And he says, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's a pretty big promise. God was calling Abram out from where he lived to go from someplace altogether new. And the Lord was going to establish a line of people who he would develop a special relationship with called the Jews, who he would bring up the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, through. God had something special, not something common, in mind for Abram. And he has something special, not something common, in mind for you. Who's going to be blessed by Jesus through you? Are you going to allow the blessing of your salvation and all that God calls you to in Christ end with you? Are you going to be a pond that gets stagnant or are you going to be a river that flows with the grace of Jesus that flows into other people's lives? Before your life impacts generations, God's going to call you to go from the familiar and into the faith zone. From the ordinary to the extraordinary, from your stable life to being stretched by God. Thankfully, verse 4 says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Good call. Those who faithfully follow God make history. Moses went from the burning bush after 40 years of feeling like a failure, he literally killed a guy. When God called him to go to Egypt and save his people. God used him to free the Jews from slavery. You know anybody in slavery? Who do you think God's going to use to free them? God used Moses to give the Jews the law. Do you know what God says? How do you think the people in your life that don't are going to hear if they don't see you living it. And he gave the Jews a homeland through Moses. There are people who are wandering around with no home, with no place and no people. Are you going to provide shelter for them? I want to tell you, you can't lead people to a place you're not going yourself. Where are you going? 
Later on, the prophets, they, they, they left their everyday lives to go to the people who needed to hear God's word. And they spoke God's word of correction, calling God's people back to the way that they knew they should be walking. If people follow you, if I live my life like you live your life, am I going to get closer to Jesus or am I going to be wandering away? All of these people throughout scripture, they all had their Abraham as their father in the faith. He gave them an example of how to follow God. But the fullness of the promise that God made to Abraham wasn't realized until generations later when Jesus Christ would ultimately fulfill all of God's promises. Are you just thankful for Jesus? Jesus was born just as God promised. And we began his ministry, he started calling regular people. Isn't it kind of scary that he called regular people, not like the standouts, not, not the, not the not, you know, temple graduates. He called regular people who worked with their hands. He called a disparate group of people, very diverse, to come and follow him. And he didn't give them any promises of a place to stay or any money or position or prestige. And these guys agreed to follow Jesus. And after three years of doing that, at the height of his popularity, Jesus was crucified. Maybe you've been disoriented since you started following Jesus. That's appropriate. If your life was just going like this, and then you started following Jesus, and he started messing with things, how many of you experienced that? Hello, if Jesus hasn't, Jesus hasn't messed with you lately, um, you might need to follow him closer. Because Jesus' goal for your life is not comfort. He will stretch you and make things uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable, you know, things, things didn't get easier for the disciples when they started following Jesus. They got more complex. And right at the moment when the promise seemed so dead and they were so disillusioned and they said, we decided we would follow. We left everything to follow our master. You know what happened then? Jesus came roaring back to life. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world proved to be the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And because he rose, they could rise and they could have new life and follow him with all of their lives. The disciples who had been so disappointed with the death of Jesus, their Savior, found new life in Jesus their Lord. Friends, every single time that God makes a promise, he keeps that promise. You might be living in between the time you started following God and believing his promise and the time that that promise is being fulfilled. I want you to know that if God's made a promise, he will keep it. You can count on it. God did what he said he would do in Abraham's life and he will in your life too. Here's the potential. If you will follow God, he will keep his promise to you about eternity and about this life. Test him and find him faithful. God uses people who will follow him to save those who are not. For 2,000 years, this has been happening. As people have decided to follow Jesus, have been telling others. So if you have found life in Jesus, in his ways, you can't help but tell other people about him, right? You don't want to find the cure to cancer and keep it a secret. You want to find the solution to drain all the toxins from your body and to heal you and to share that with other people. So following Jesus doesn't end in coming to church and getting saved. That's just the beginning. Your baptism is an immersion into new life. It's the beginning of you learning how to follow Jesus with your whole life. You may think the one decision that matters is to follow Jesus, but that just opens up every next decision, doesn't it? And Jesus calls you to learn how to, how to choose as Jesus would choose. How to decide every decision you have as though Jesus is Lord. Jesus calls you to bring your relationships to him. He calls you to, to get so personal that you bring your sexuality to him and start living as though Jesus is Lord. He will mess with your life to take the mess of your life 
and make it into something pure and pleasing to him, which is going to be the most life-giving for you. Jesus even calls you to lay down all you are and all you have because it's his in the first place. Following Jesus continues with you joining Jesus on his mission, telling others about how they too can have a new life. Today, God's still calling people to follow him. And you know, if you decide to follow Jesus with every part of who you are, he may not even change your physical address, but he will absolutely change your spiritual direction. The question today is, will you follow Jesus wherever he wants you to go? If you're here today and you haven't begun following Jesus, one of us would love to chat with you after the service. And church, when we together follow God, he will take us to places we wouldn't get to go otherwise. I've seen this happen in my own life. Consider this. When God called Abraham to go from where he was, the people he knew, the places he knew, the plan that he knew, God didn't give Abraham the go-to right away. Where do I go, Lord? The Lord said, to the land I will show you. Don't hesitate to take your next step in God's direction just because you don't know what the final destination looks like. God wants you to learn how to trust him enough to take each successive step in allowing him to shape and reshape your life. When God's people as a group start to do this, it's a holy thing. And God has used a group of people here, a new life, to do this. You know, when I was growing up in this church, we met in a little church building over in Vestal. And we started changing everything about the church except for the message in order to reach out to people who didn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we had to make a decision over 20 years ago when the church grew up and maxed out that building. We had to decide, will we stop growing and stop reaching people who don't know Jesus, or will we put everything on the line and follow him? We sold the building when we didn't even know the place where we would land. We rented the Boys and Girls Club in Endicott, and that was hard. Wasn't it, Al? Every one of these chairs you're sitting in came off of a trailer and down two flights of steps to the gym. I can still feel the... Uh, <laughs> every Saturday night, we sweat and we bled so that we could see God grow his church. I'm glad a group of people were willing to sacrifice to make that happen. God supplied this building for us. We bought it for next to nothing and then poured a bunch of money into it to get it ready to meet you. Aren't you glad that 20 years ago, people sacrificed so that this ministry could exist? Now, today, God has planted us here at 201 Hill Avenue in a neighborhood that I don't know about you, but I think the precious people in this neighborhood need Jesus. What do you think? Do you think the people in this greater community have had their fill of the poison that this world has to offer? Are you sick of addiction tearing people and families apart? Are you tired of people walking away from the Lord 
and never knowing the plan that he has and his mercy and his grace and the transforming power. Church, you think we should do something about it? For over a year, I and our board and our staff have been working a plan to present to you what we need to do now in this next season of ministry. Because this community and this region needs new life in Jesus Christ. Amen? And God has put us here for this time and this place to reach out to people. I believe that God wants to fill this church to overflowing. Look around. There's not that many seats and we're still in the tail end of COVID. What are we going to do as we continue to reach out and reach more people? Well, we considered, what do we do? Do we move? No, God closed the door on that. We've done all the research. This here is our church home. And I believe that from this location, God wants to grow this ministry. Someday we're going to branch out. But right now, it's time to become rooted right here in this place. Over the coming weeks, we're going to talk about this in this series from the ground up. Because I believe that God wants to grow a ministry here from the ground up that's going to supply for the spiritual new life for many, many people. But in order for us to be ready to receive those people, we need to do some things practically. On the way out today, you're going to receive a little brochure. It's going to tell you about some projects that we have coming and what it's going to take to get these projects done. I think we need to do some things. First, I think when you pull into the parking lot, you should not see bricks falling off the building. How about that? You can clap for that. I think it matters to the community that they see a building that is not falling apart. And I think that if you show up to New Life and you have a mobility issue, You shouldn't have to have the challenge of all sorts of stairs. We've got a three-story building. We need an elevator. Yes. (laughs) Pastor Derek agrees. We need to expand the lobby where you all have the greatest conversations before and after church. And we need to completely renovate our power-up room so that the children who are the next generation of new life have an incredible worship space. And we need to be able to maximize the use of all three of these floors of what God's given us here at New Life because this is going to become the hub of operations for the ministry that God wants to build in the future. But it's not going to happen unless all of God's people commit, and I don't mean two or three, all of God's people who call New Life home come together and are willing to pray to the Lord and sacrifice so that it can happen. So you're going to get one of these on the way out as well. This is a commitment card that I do not want you to fill out until November. We're going to talk about this next week. You're going to get lots of details, but you will see on this what it's going to take for us as a whole church to see these projects happen. So church, I'm convinced of this. If we will follow God, he will make this church into a life-giving place that gives new life to many. We're going to talk a little bit about a project in the coming weeks, but we're going to do that because it's all about people coming to Christ. Go ahead and listen to this. Stephanie and I were sitting in the, uh, towards the back. We had come in a little late that Sunday and usually we sit up to the front, but for whatever reason, we just weren't able to. So we sat on the side and Joe, I believe, was talking about marriage and how you can repair that, things to work on in marriage. And I remember uh, right at the end and he kind of had a little bit of a salvation message, nothing too, you know, fire and brimstone, just a little bit there. I remember Stephanie saying, oh, there's a guy up there that um, seems to have a little bit of a, a reaction. I'm like, well, what do you mean he had a reaction? Is he sneezing? Like, what, what's going on? And uh, sure enough, I looked over and he just, um, very emotional about something that just happened. And she said, you really need to go talk to him. I said, no. So I thought about it for a second and um, I really felt the Lord tugging in my heart that you 
this is, you know, we're calling you, you need to go. And I still said no. And I realized it was kind of pointless to say no, so I, I went anyways. So I just sat down next to him and said, hey, can I pray with you? I had no idea what he was going through, and he said, he kind of looked up, a little bit surprised that somebody was standing there as he's, you know, tears are streaming down his face, and he said, yeah, I'd, I'd love someone to pray with me. And we started praying. Thank the Lord for his work and that service, um, and the, the people in the church and what they've done, and for um, uh, the, the gentleman that I was being able to pray with, uh, for the Lord, the work that he was doing in his life. After a little bit, he shared with me, he had just lost everything in his life, or going through a divorce, I should say. And just a very devastating time in his life. And he's, you know, just hit rock bottom. I said, no, oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, how can I pray for you? He said, I've been coming to church for a couple of months. I said, oh, great, well, what are your next steps? And he said, uh, well, Today, you know, was the day I just got saved. And I said, oh, wow, well, I, I guess, you know, we need to worry about, you know, next steps a little later, but, you know, let's just take a little bit of time, you know. Uh, so we prayed um, just a little bit more, rejoiced in, that he came into um, Christ's family, uh, became a child of God. And it was um, really special to know that he needed somebody to talk to at that exact moment. And as much as I didn't want to go, I knew I needed to go. And it was, I was the right person to be there at that exact time. I walked him out in this hall, said, hey, John, you know, this gentleman here wanted to tell you something. And he said, I did it. John goes, what do you mean? And, he, and immediately the guy just broke down. And, and he said, I, today was the day. And, um, you know, we rejoiced and we were able to get him a Bible. A very unique experience to be able for me to be able to be there for someone and pray with them when they need it. I never had those huge life-saving transformations. I was saved at a very young age, probably I'd say I'm around five. Um, so just I grew up in the church. I had no huge life-saving transformation. I didn't hit rock bottom at five, but to be with somebody that, that hit rock bottom and to be able to to pray with them as they were able to just let all that go, let all the, the struggling and the frustrations and all that just, God takes that entire weight off of their shoulders and they are a brand new person. It's a truly amazing thing to witness.